Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to see you guys. Those welcome those of you that are watching, joining us online from your homes or wherever you are. Just want to welcome everyone here this morning. We're in a series we kicked off last week, just on the promises of God. It's that God keeps every promise forever. And last week we talked about the promise of the Holy Spirit. So are you guys ready to get into this sermon this morning? You guys ready to get into this? Yeah. Well, this morning we're going to talk about the promise of peace. So I was trying to get you amped up because that's what every pastor says you're supposed to do to connect with the crowd. So here's what I want us to do to start off. Because many times in the course of a week and a day and a crazy year, you know, that so many times we live in a culture where we're just constantly on the go, 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 do, 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 right? That what I want us to do is I just want to take a moment and just be still and just be quiet. So what I want everybody to do is I just want everybody just to kind of close their eyes All right, let's take a couple deep breaths, and let's just have a moment of quiet. Now, that's hard to do, isn't it? (laughs) Of course, Charlie's snoring over there. Can't give him a second. You know, it's easy to, you know, it's hard to do, I think, sometimes. I don't know about you, but how many of you, it was just hard to get to keep your mind from going, all right? I mean, we, we are so a people on the go. But this is what God's Word tells us. I want to start off with this focus here when it comes to just peace. And I think we really struggle with walking and living in God's peace. In Psalm 46, God just kind of given this declaration, all right, to His people. And He says, be still and know that I am God. It's this command, in a sense, that he's saying, I want you to be still. The word still in the Hebrew language means to sink down, to just drop. All right? And I think so many times we, you know, sometimes we drop not because we want to drop, right? It's because we're so stressed out and we're so worked up, you know, that we, we just go, go, go. But, but God commands us, be still and know that I'm God. I will be honored by every nation. I will be honored throughout the world. And so, so what, I want to, what I want to do this morning is I want to kind of, I kind of want us to walk us through this psalm so we can kind of see it in its context, all right? See Psalm 46 in its context. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to read it the way the media would portray it, all right? So it's going to be a little hard for you to follow along on on the screens here, but I'm going to read it. You'll see the bold things I'm going to read. I'm going to read it the way the media would would portray it, all right? So here we go. This This is Psalm 46, all right? Put a first verse up here on the screens, all right? Always in times of trouble. So fear when the earthquakes come and the mountains crumble into the sea. The oceans roar and foam as the waters surge. A river to the city, our sacred home, that city can be destroyed. From the very break of day, the nations are in chaos. Kingdoms crumble, the earth melts. Here among us, works of destruction upon the world, wars throughout the earth. With fire. And then verse 10, be still and know that I am God. Now, it would be really hard to be still if that's how everything was portrayed, right? And I think the challenge we live in is that's kind of the culture that we live in. Matter of fact, we're, we're in this, this parenting series that we, we started a couple years ago, and I'm, I'll go back through this here in a second, but we started this parenting series a couple, couple weeks ago, and it's by Gary Thomas, and it's really good. As a parent, I hope we, we're probably going to offer it again, and as parents, I would just really strongly encourage you to, to come. We're, we're having like the fourth session this afternoon, or fifth session this afternoon. It's a six-week course, really, really good stuff. But in one of the weeks, he was talking about just how we're so afraid our kids might get hurt. You know, I, I remember years ago, this is totally different from this parenting series, one, one pastor said, we live in the most, you know, insured, overprotected nation on the planet, because we're so afraid that our kids or somebody just might get hurt, right? How many of you grew up playing on jungle gyms with concrete underneath of them, playing, you're running around, doing, I mean, we can't do anything today because somebody might get hurt, right? And you might get sued, right? And we have to close all the doors to everything. Well, well he, Gary Thomas talks about how the media, we live in this country where the media just, just spins everything up. And he said, I had the privilege one day, I was in seminary, and I was talking with one of my professors, a guy by the name, you've probably heard of him, he's an author um, as well, J.I. Packer. All right, who's from England. And he was talking with him about fear. And he said, he said, you know how your country operates, right? 
He said, your, your, your country, your, your whole premise is based off of fear. And, you, and your media, they just stir it up over and over and over again. He said, if you don't have an enemy, you have nothing to live for. Now, I was thinking about that. It's, it's just kind of, as parents, you know, and as a person, it's like, wow. I never, that's an outsider's perspective of how we live. All right, that we are just constantly living it. So, so how many of you um, were born in the 60s? Some of you may have, well, how many of you remember the blizzard of 78? Let me just say that. All right, remember the blizzard of 78? Some of you are young, like, what are you talking about? All right, now here's what's crazy. He, what he did in this is he started walking through from, he's around my age, just things in history, the times he's been alive, just things the media has stirred up. All right, and we're going to get to this. Why it's so hard for us to live in peace. All right, so the blizzard of 78 hit. And I remember there was so much snow on the ground. You couldn't go anywhere. I had to go out and dig little, you know, trenches for my dog to go, our dog to go around the backyard. My brother and I, we made these huge igloos. You know, it was so much fun having all that snow, but everything came to a standstill. Now, here's the deal. I didn't even remember this until near the end of the winter. I was watching the news on Fox 59 one night, and Brian Wilk said, he said, you, most of you probably don't know this. He said, but... The 70s were known in recorded history as a mild ice age. And the whole big push to me was like, climate change, climate change. We are headed for an ice age. Here's how you need to prepare for an ice age. You better stock up on toilet paper. <laughs> I'm sure they probably said that back then, right? It seems to always be toilet paper. I don't know what is a toilet paper, but make sure you got some. You know, but, but it was the whole thing with, with the Ice Age, you know, that, gosh, you know, everything's going to change, you know, and, and there's going to be an Ice Age. And then there, there was the whole thing of just the energy and oil crisis. Remember that? We're running out of energy. We're running out of oil. You better stock up. I mean, everything's coming to an end. Then there was the Cold War, the nuclear threat, and you better build a bunker. I mean, he goes through and he shows all these graphics that were on the news. You better start building a bunker. You better have toilet paper. You better have canned goods. You better have all these, these things because the world's just coming to and then there's a nuclear threat then there was the arms race and then how many of you remember acid rain there was even a song written about it acid rain right don't go outside when it's raining because you will melt <laughs> and let me just say this they said don't eat the snow right especially if it's yellow don't eat the snow <laughs> regardless of acid rain don't eat the yellow snow just 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 giving you some advice there all right, but, but it was like all these things just got spun up and spun up and spun up. And here, you know, God's word addresses all these things that go on. They've always gone on in the history of the world since sin entered creation, right? And so in this context, you know, God goes through all these things. And the very first verse says, God is our refuge in strength, always ready to help in times of trouble. It's, and so our, the focus is completely different. And when you go through all the chaos and all the challenges right in the middle of it, it's just, this command, God says, be still and know that I am God. And because we live in a culture that just thrives on these things, I think it's really hard to walk in peace. So let me just kind of give you a bullet point I'm going to put up here on the screen. This is kind of how I think we tend to live in our culture. We tend to thrive on fear and stress rather than le live in the peace of Christ. And I think it's hard for us as American Christians to embrace this peace that Christ calls us into because we are constantly chasing an enemy. We are constantly thriving on fear and thriving on all these things. And the media just stirs it up and stirs it up. And I can guarantee you five years from now, nobody's even going to think or care about COVID-19. It's going to be here and gone. Remember Y2K? I mean, you know, the whole fear, remember Y2K, that whole crazy thing that happened? You know, the whole fear was don't get on an airplane because they're going to be falling out of the sky. Once those computers change over, Jesus is coming back. The end of the world is here. I mean, it was one thing after another. And we tend to be a people. We thrive on it. We thrive on fear. We thrive. I, I really believe that we're all addicts. We're adrenaline addicts. We are self-induced adrenaline addicts because we have grown up in a culture that thrives on spinning everything up to keep us going. If we don't have something to keep us going and if we're not stirring everything up, I mean, it, we have nothing to live for. And, and the Gospels and the Word of God tells us to live completely different. All right, so, so as we, we looked at this last week. Jesus is preparing his disciples for his departure. Several weeks ago, we celebrated Easter. 
It's a great weekend. We saw some people being baptized, just changed lives, moving forward. Just the whole crucifixion of our Savior and His resurrection from the dead and all that Christ had done for us. And so what we did last week and doing this week is Jesus is trying to prepare His followers for all the chaos that was about to unfold. His arrest, his being, him being beaten and then crucified on a cross. They thought it was all over. And then the resurrection would change everything. And here's some words that Jesus gave to his followers before all those events took place. John chapter 14. This is part of that upper room discourse I mentioned last week. Is Jesus is with his disciples teaching them. And Jesus tells them this. He says, I'm leaving you with a gift. All right, last week we talked about the promise of the Holy Spirit as one of those gifts. All right, Here he says, I'm leaving you with a gift peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. He's saying you are not going to find peace in this world because the peace that I'm talking about and the peace that I give is nothing that the world can give. It is very different, but I'm leaving you with this gift. And Jesus says, I am the giver of this gift. And you're going to have peace of mind and heart. So don't be troubled or afraid. All right, let's skip forward a couple chapters. John chapter 16, verse 33. Jesus restates this whole essence, you know, the importance and significance of this gift of peace. And he's going through explaining all the things that are about to take place. They still don't understand. He says, I've told you all this so that you may have what? Peace. And peace where? Where? In me, it's in him, right? That you may have peace in me. Here on earth, your life is going to be so easy when you come to faith in me. It's going to be easy street. It's going to be a Disney story come true. Right? That's not what it says, right? What did Jesus say? He just said this. He said, you will have peace in me, but here on earth, you will have not some trials. He said, you will have many trials and sorrows. But then he says these words, but take heart because I have overcome the world. That's the significance of Jesus dying on the cross and him rising from the grave. That's the significance of the resurrection. We don't have to walk in in just in chaos and fear and worry about all these things. We can actually walk and live in the peace of Christ. And what Jesus tells us here in these two verses here, let me just put a bullet point up here, is understanding this when it comes to this promise of peace. Peace isn't found in the absence of problems, but in the person of Jesus Christ. We will always have problems. On this side of eternity. There will always be crises. There will always be something for the media to spin. All right, We will always have these things. They've always been there from once sin entered into creation. We see this over and over again throughout the history of mankind. And in the history and the scriptures we see this over and over again. And I firmly believe the farther we get from Jesus. We're not staying connected with him. The more we get caught up in all the chaos and all the the craziness that we just spin, 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 we get caught up in it. The closer we press into the person of Jesus Christ, the more we can walk in the promise of peace and live out what Jesus promised his disciples. Matter of fact, when we go and we look into the Old Testament, God promised his people this back in the Old Testament when they were up against some of the most challenging circumstances they had ever faced. In Isaiah 54, we shared from, I shared with you Isaiah 53 last week, some of the most incredibly detailed prophetic words about the Savior who was to come. Everything to detail what Jesus went through. And Isaiah's writing to, to God's people. The kingdom of Israel is divided. There's a northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. All right? The kingdom of Israel is on the north. The kingdom of Judah is on the south. All right? They've been divided. And Isaiah's writing to both kingdoms. He's saying, look, there's a world power that's coming. You know, you could say Isaiah's prophesying doom and gloom along with Jeremiah. There's a world power coming. God's raising up. First there's the Syrians that took down the northern kingdom. And then there was the Babylonians, King Nebuchadnezzar and all that. And he's going to come and he's going to wipe everything out. You know, but God's going to send a savior. And in the midst of all the chaos that's going to come, God gives his people this word in Isaiah 54 verse 10. He says, here's the deal. The mountains may disappear and the hills may come to an end, but my love will never disappear. My promise of peace will not come to an end, says the Lord who shows mercy to you. Now, most translations, that word promise is the word covenant. That is a binding contract 
promise that God is making his people. When we stay pressed in him, he says, my promise to you is that you will have peace and it will never, ever end. But it's in him, regardless of what goes on around us. There's a peace that we can have. And so I think a lot of times when it comes to understanding this concept of peace, we tend to think of peace of more of like a vacation, right? I mean, vacation would be really good right now, right? All right? We just get out of here and go get away. And I tend, I tend to think we think in ways that you know, like peace is more of a vacation rather than just you know, walking in this peace regardless of what our circumstances are. So what I want to do is I'm going to kind of throw out some circumstances and I want you to kind of put your hand up if you want to do that. Even if at home, you still have to do this. Even if I can't see you, let's put your hand up. I see I can't see you, but I want you to do it anyway. All right, so I had to say that. So here I want you to do. If this raises your blood pressure or gets you worked up, you know, raise your hand. If it doesn't, keep your hand down, all right? Here we go. Here goes some scenarios, just mental pictures. Crazy busy day at work where you just can't keep up with everything. You got so much on your plate. You just, you just like, you just kind of spun, right? Blood pressure goes up, right? One of those days, one of those weeks, you just cannot get caught up. Just raises your blood pressure, right? How about this one? Sitting in a jacuzzi with the water at just the right temperature and the jets just, just perfect, Ronnie. Stress or peace? We tend to associate that with peace, right? Unless some of you are like, ah, ah, is the water going to be right? But once you're in it and it's just right, all right? All right, how about a birthday party with 25 three-year-olds running around? <laughs> ah! How many of you are living that right now? <laughs> Let's pray for them right now. All right? I mean, that just seems like, ah, right? Just blood pressure going up, trying to keep everything in control. Where'd he go? Where'd she go? Where'd he, right? Just, all right. How about a hike in the mountains next to a crystal clear lake? All right? We associate that with peace, right? How about driving in rush hour traffic out on the interstate? All right? All right? When you get home, there's just imprints in your steering wheel, all right? You got to go get a massage because you're stressed out from all the crazy people driving and some of them are you. Anyway, how about walking on the beach, all right? We associate, isn't it funny? We associate certain things. The challenge is for us, now those things, those certain situations do bring a sense of calm, but the kind of peace that Jesus is talking about transcends our circumstances, It doesn't matter if there's 25, three-year-olds running around. It doesn't matter all these crazy things. Let me just kind of put another bullet point up here, just tying this all together. God's promise of peace isn't determined by your situation. This is why Jesus is preparing his disciples for all the chaos that was about to unfold. It's not determined by your situation, but rather having his presence in your situation. And that is a key thing. That is important. We as Christ followers, our lives should look very different from the rest of the world, especially when all the chaos is constantly being spun up and going on around us. Our lives should look very different. We have the promise of the Holy Spirit, and we have this promise of this gift of peace. Matter of fact, when you read in the scriptures, you get to the end of the gospels where, where they, they just, Jesus dies on a cross, they don't know what to do. And then after the resurrection, after we, he appeared over 500, it changed everything for them. These guys were fearless, right? These men and women, I mean, they didn't care what anybody thought. They're out proclaiming the good news. They they were arrested. They were thrown in prison. They were beaten. They could care less. They understood the promise of the Spirit and the peace that only Jesus could bring regardless of the circumstances. And God promises us this same thing. Regardless of what's going on, regardless of the world around us is falling apart, whether there's global warming or whether we're headed for an ice age, God is still on the throne, and he wants us to live and walk out in his peace. So what we're going to look at today is just how to enjoy this promise that Jesus promises, the promise of peace, how we can enjoy it and live it out regardless of all the craziness and chaos that goes on. And the first thing, this is really simple this morning, the first thing, number one, is this. The first key to understanding and walking in the peace that God promised us is to have peace with God. You can't have the kind of peace that Jesus is talking about without being in a relationship with him. The world doesn't offer peace. 
I mean, we, you know, you, you see it all the time whenever someone's given a speech. You know, it was always like the famous line everybody laughed about at, you know, the Miss USA pageants. It was always world peace, right? World peace, right? And everybody would just always, because that seemed like the common thing. The peace that Jesus is talking about is not world peace. It's something much bigger. It's something much greater. It is a very different kind of peace. And that peace begins by having peace with God. We talked about several weeks ago how sin separates us, us from God. There's no way we can be made right with God with us being sinful. That's why Jesus came. That's why he poured out his life on a cross. To atone for our sins to pay the penalty for our sins, that we don't have to pay the penalty for our sins and we put our faith in him. And then the resurrection was a game changer. He conquered not only sin, but he conquered death so that we could live this life and that we could make us right with God. And so we just want to look at this passage here in Romans chapter 4 leading into chapter 5 just to kind of explain why. I want to give some context here. My main point is Romans 5, 1. But, you know, when these letters were written, there weren't chapters and verses. They were letters. All right, so we just kind of put it in context here. In Romans chapter 4, the Apostle Paul is talking about Abraham and his faith. And because he trusted God and he obeyed God, it was credited to him as righteous. And we pick up in verse 24, and he says this, says, God will also count us as righteous if we believe in him, the one who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. Verse 25, he was handed over to die because of our sins. All right, because of our sins, and he was raised to life to make us right with God. That's the whole reason he came, so that we could enter into a right relationship with God. All right, then we're going to go to chapter 5, verse 1. It's a continuation of Paul's thought. Therefore, because of what God has done through Christ, therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have what? We have peace, and we have peace with God. Because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. That was the significance of the crucifixion and the resurrection. So that one, when we can be made in right relationship with God, as we looked at last week, the promise of the Holy Spirit, we can have God the Spirit alive in us when we profess faith in Christ. And not only that, Jesus leaves us with this gift, this gift of peace. That we don't have to get spun up. We don't have to get worked up. It doesn't matter what the media says. It doesn't matter what's going on in the world. We can live out in this peace, this gift that God gives us through his son, Jesus Christ, because of what he did on the cross for us. So therefore, our lives should look very different because God calls us to have peace with him. And that's where it begins. Being in right relationship with him. And daily cultivating that right relationship with him so that we can walk and live in God's peace. The second thing, number two, just want to kind of build on this. It begins with a relationship with God. The second thing, number two, is I want to be a little intentional here, like as if I'm not every Sunday, but I just want to be intentional here and just that we need to make time to rest. That's why I want to kind of give us a moment of stillness and silence this morning because we are just constantly on the go. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I'm just as guilty. It's like my mind. So how many of you have trouble going to sleep at night because you just can't turn off your brain? Right? So many things we got to do. So many things. Oh my gosh, we got this coming. I got this coming. You know, and, our, and it's like it's hard to turn this thing off. God should have put a switch in because we're not smart enough to turn it off. So we just go, click. <laughs> right? So we need to make time to rest. That's why God says, be still and know that I am God. But we live in a culture that is just constantly on the go. We're constantly being amped up. We're constantly thriving and living on, on our adrenaline. Go, 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 do, do, do. And so many times in Scripture, God says to be still. Slow down. Make time for rest. Now, I'm gonna, last week I had some common phrases that I shared. I'm going to share another one today, and I want you to finish this common phrase, all right? There is no rest for the... I hear two different words, because there's two different ways, all right? One of them is there's no rest for the weary, and then there's another one that says there's no rest for the wicked, all right? Now, it's a concept that comes out of Scripture, right? Second Thessalonians 1 talks about that those that don't know God, that don't have a right relationship, that haven't made peace with God, that they're headed for everlasting destruction. That's why we got to share the good news of Christ, all right? There's this everlasting ongoing. There's no rest for, for the wicked. But, it's, you know, it got translates to, you know, changed over time to there's no rest for the weary, right? And so we often, how many times you caught yourself saying that? Well, there's no rest for the weary, right? We're always wearing ourselves out. Burning the candle, both ends, constantly going to go, wearing ourselves out. Now, here's the thing. Here's what God's word says. All right, I'm going to go back from the very beginning. 
In the very beginning, God created. And God created everything, and he said it was good in chapter 1. Then we get to chapter 2, verse 2 in Genesis. It says, by the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he just kept right on working. No, it says on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Verse 3, then God blessed the seventh day. He blessed that day and made it holy. That means it's set apart. He set apart the seventh day because on it, he rested from all the work of creating that he had to do. Now, I really don't believe that God had to rest in all of his majesty, in all of his power, but God did it. He rested and he set it apart. And sometimes I ask myself, so why do we think that we are smarter than God? If he intentionally built in rest, why do we think, being created in the image of God, that we don't need to build in rest? Right? And so, and so I hear Christians all the time, they'll say stuff, well, I've surrendered my life to Christ. Well, let me ask you this, does your schedule indicate that? Right? Does your schedule indicate that? Because if you're not building in time to be still and know that he is God and time to rest then you, have you really surrendered every part of your life to Christ? Because this, and, I, and we all struggle with it. I struggle with it. We live in this culture. Go, go, go. Do, do, do. You got to just give us some of what God wants me to do. I, gotta, I just got to go. And we, our bodies are designed to need rest. And so this was an intentional thing that God did. He rested. Jesus often rested. We see that in the Gospels. Matter of fact, it's one of the Ten Commandments is to take a Sabbath day. Here's what Ezekiel wrote about the Sabbath. Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 12. This is God speaking to his people through the prophet Ezekiel in the Old Testament. He said, And I gave them my Sabbath days of rest as a sign between them and me. It was to remind them that I am the Lord. And that I am the Lord who set them apart to be holy. So I just want to kind of give a bullet point here. What is the purpose of the Sabbath? Ezekiel clearly tells us the purpose of the Sabbath is to remind us who God is and who we are. We are not God. We try to play God, right? And so the whole purpose of the Sabbath is to remind us who God is. There's a hierarchy. God is on the throne. And, and, and he will always be on the throne. And yet so many times, this is what the challenge, this is the very thing we're learning in our men's group in this kingdom man, is this whole thing about the way that, that Satan just deceived Eve and then, and then Adam fell into this whole trap was is that he changed God's name from the Lord God to God. Rather than being the sovereign God that we surrender to, that we submit to as the God of the kingdom, we just make him God, not the Lord God. And so sin enters into creation, and it's messed us all up. And we think we can just go, go, go like the Energizer Bunny and never run out of energy. So we need to be intentional to rest. The purpose of the Sabbath is to remind us who God is and remind us who we are as we make time intentionally to set aside, to be still, and know that he is God. And so you've heard me say this before and got this from another parenting course did several years ago where it just talked about how we, we live in an activity-rich culture and one of the things that they, they talk about is how the way we often raise our kids, because we, we, we just raise our kids to be activity rich, but yet spiritually depleted, right? Because we live, we just got to go, we got to go. There's so many things. And I'm telling you, I raised four kids, and I'm telling you, it was not easy raising four kids, going from one event, from basketball to, to football to soccer to dance to gymnastics. I mean, it was one thing after another, but we, were, we tried to be the best we could to be intentional to making sure our kids were at church every Sunday and that they made time. We taught them how to spend time with God and to be still and know that they are God. And by the grace of God, every one of our kids are all walking with God today. It's important that we're intentional because here's the deal. More is caught than taught. And it's not just what we say. I can sit now and talk with my, my kids' theology all day long. Two of them got degrees in it, right? And, and it's, we can sit around and talk theology, but it doesn't matter how much we talk about. What matters is what we do and how we model our lives. And so we can tell our kids all day long how important God is and how they need to, to give their life to the person of Jesus Christ. But if we're not modeling it in our schedules with every part of our life, then they're not going to catch it. They're, they're only going to catch what we're doing, not what we're saying. 
So it's important that we're intentional in passing these things on, that we can walk in the peace of Christ that he has called us to. All right, the third thing, the third key in just embracing this promise of peace, the Apostle Paul gives us this one, is to pray about everything. It's the whole thing of, of just submitting to the Lordship of Christ. Where we, we talk, you've heard me share the wheel illustration where Christ is the center, he's the hub of everything, every thought, every decision, all the things we do, every part of my life. And so I tr- do my best to surrender it to the Lordship of Christ. How I spend my money, how I spend my time, what I do, surrendering it to the Lordship of Christ every day. God, what do you want me to do? All right? This is what Paul wrote to the church in Philippi. They were, he wrote a whole section in his letter to this. It was something they were struggling with, this whole thing of being amped up. And there's so much to do. Chapter, chapter 4, verse 6 and 7, Paul wrote this, Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all that He has done. Verse 7, Then... As we do this, as we be still before God and we let you, knowing that he is God, every day we connect with him, you know, that we pray about everything, we tell him what we need, then he says, you will experience God's peace. And this peace is so different, he says, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And so what Paul is saying is that there's, there's some key principles to life here and one of these key principles is to pray about everything. Matter of fact, let me just put this principle up on the, on the screen. Kind of got a principle here. One of the principles we get from God's word and in life, the principle of anything and everything. This is basically what Paul is giving us. The principle of anything and everything. So what he's saying is, the principle is, don't worry about anything, pray about everything. Now, I believe that we most of the time get this reversed. Right? That because we live in this culture, because of our, our sinful nature, we get all caught up. And what do we do? We worry about everything and we pray about nothing. <laughs> Most of the time, right? Unless we have to. <laughs> right? And until something really gets bad, that's like, well, I guess I better pray. <laughs> right? I mean, it's just our tendency. I'm just as guilty. We, we worry about everything because there's so many things to worry about. Jesus even addressed, addressed this in the Sermon of the Mount. You know, he says, ask, seek, and knock. Your Heavenly Father already knows everything you're going to need. He knows it. And so Paul, he picks up on the same thing that was handed down to him. He says, look, don't worry about anything, but pray about everything. This is the principle. Pray about everything. Don't worry about anything. Then you will experience God's peace. A peace that's beyond anything that this world has to offer. And in 2 Thessalonians, Paul is writing to another church, a church that is under heavy persecution. I mean, their world has been turned upside down. And this was a common phrase that we see in in most of Paul's letters. All right, this is the beginning of his letter here. It's a very common phrase that was among Jewish people. They would always say shalom, all right, Jerusalem, part of the word of Jerusalem, shalom, Jerusalem is the city of peace. All right, it's a very common phrase, peace, peace be with you. They understood the significance of God's peace, but then over time it just becomes hearsay, right? You just kind of say it. But Paul was intentional, and he began most of his letters this way. And in 2 Thessalonians, as he's writing to this church that's under a lot of persecution, a lot of hardship, he begins his letter this way. He says, May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. And then he goes on. He's addressing some of the issues that they're going through. I'm going to skip down to verse 11 here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. He says, So we're, what are we doing? We keep on praying for you. We believe in the power of prayer, so we're praying for you. We know everything that you're going through, so we keep on praying for you, asking God to enable you to live a life worthy of his call, regardless of what's going on, right? He says you live a life worthy of his call, and may he give you the power, we talked about that last week, through the power of the Holy Spirit that rose Christ from the grave, may he give you the power to accomplish all the good things your faith prompts you to do. And then, when he gets to the conclusion of 2 Thessalonians, this this second letter that he writes to this church, 2 Thessalonians 3.16, he says, Now, in the midst of all these things he's addressing, now may the Lord of peace himself give you his peace at all times and in every situation. The Lord be with you all. He said, God will give you peace at all times and in every situation if we press into him. 
if we slow down in the midst of all the chaos, all the craziness, was no different for them than it is for us today. Except they were under heavy persecution. We've, we want to begin to experience very, very, very little bits of that. But we can experience God's peace at all times in every situation. Last thing, number four, is this key to just living out this promise, enjoying the promise of God's peace. Number four is just to focus your life on the giver of peace. Let me ask you, what is the focus of your life? Because whatever you focus your life on is what you'll become. Whatever you focus your thoughts on are what you'll become. Remember when you were in driver's ed and they were telling you at nighttime when there's a car coming your way with lights on it, what they tell you not to do? Don't look at the lights, right? Or why? You're going to crash right into the lights, right? All right, stay focused on the road in front of you. All right, we see this over and over again in the scriptures. We're to focus our life on the giver of peace. In Proverbs 4, 23, I'm reading this from the Expanded Bible, so I'm going to stretch it a little bit. All right, Expanded Bible says this. It says, be careful what you think. All right, and you may know this, the next part here where it says, above all that you do, you know, above all you guard and you protect your heart. All right, in the Hebrew mindset, this, this thought, your mind, you know, is all this inner part of our being, all right, and our thoughts were part of the key part of that. And so it's saying, be careful what you think. Above all, you guard, protect your heart, because your thoughts run your life. Your life flows from it. It's, it's the wellspring of life comes from how we think. What is the focus of our life? We're to guard this inner part of our being, our heart, our thoughts. They're, they're tied together. And what we focus on is what we're going to become. And sometimes I think we, we kind of take more of a, a shotgun approach to life. We're just going to try to shoot, you know, shot and, and, and as many things as we can and hope we hit something that, that's worth something, right? We kind of have this shotgun approach. And see, years ago, see, I, I never owned a shotgun. Um, I do now. Years ago, my brother-in-law, he asked me to go rabbit hunting. It was, I'd been married, you know, to my wife for a couple years. And, the, you know, he, and his, later on, their sons, they always go hunting. And he said, hey, you want to go rabbit hunting? It was the middle of the winter. I was like, sure. You know, so I borrowed my grandma's shotgun. And, and when we're out there shooting, shooting these, you know, these poor little bunnies, you know. And, and you know, I was, I was like, feel bad for those little things, you know, but, but we're, we went rabbit hunting. I'd never gone before. And so I was, I was, I had these coveralls on my father-in-law gave me and I'm these card artists, I'm kicking up rabbits everywhere. And they're like, all right, all right, Jim, it's your turn. You need to take a shot. And so I'm sitting there, you know, and this one comes running out. I'm sitting there like this. And they're like, Jim, pull the trigger. You have a shotgun. I was like, oh, I thought I had to aim right at it. You know, it's like, no, you have a shotgun, pull the trigger. Why? Cause he just goes everywhere. I didn't know what I was doing. Poor little thing. Didn't even make it over the ridge. Anyway, <laughs> it was Thumper. I ruined the whole Bambi story. <laughs> but I think sometimes we have this shotgun approach. We just hope that something hits. But what the scriptures calls us to is to be intentional and to focus. Focus on the giver of peace. Focus our hearts, our lives, our thoughts on the one that gives us peace. Isaiah, once again, wrote in the midst of turmoil. Isaiah 26, verse 3. This is God's promise to his people. It says, You will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. That is a focus. Not taking a shotgun approach to life, hoping something hits. It's a focus. Keeping our lives the aim of our lives, focused on the giver of peace. That's where we will get peace. And then the last thing, Colossians 3.15, just closing with this. Paul said this to the church in Colossae. He said, let the peace of Christ do what in your hearts? Rule. We should stand out in the world. Because we should have the peace of Christ ruling in our hearts. He says, since as members of one body, you were called to what? What is your calling? You were called to peace. A peace that this world cannot give, that is only found in the giver of peace. And that's how God wants us to focus our lives and live our lives. He's given us this promise, the promise of peace. It doesn't matter what goes on in the world around us. The peace 
that Jesus promises is found in him and him alone. And we've got to be intentional to be still and know that he is God. Let's pray.